the Lord. I want you to shout, the Lord's name be praised. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Hallelujah. Amen. We invite you unto the divine favor service of the Jesus Glory Ministries, JGM for short, being streamed from the International Headquarters, Holy Ghost Cathedral. I want to look to the Lord in prayer and in worship. Let your heart be open to God's word. Say, Dear Father, I worship you. I adore you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's no God like unto you. Behind you, there's no God. Beside you, there's no God. After you, there will be no God. You are eternal. You are infinite. You are immutable. You are omnipotent. Whatever you decide is what you do. What you say is what you bring to pass. What you plan is what you perform. And no other can ask you, what do you do? Or restrain your hand. You are sovereign. And you are power to give life and to kill at the same time. But thank God you are father of life, light, love, and liberty. In your name, I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. We continue with our series on Christ and the Antichrist, preparation for them. So this will be the second section of it. And we came to the realization that there are many passages in the Bible that tells of the last days. And we read passages from 1 Timothy and then 2 Timothy. And then we went to Ephesians also chapter 5. And there are passages that look diametrically opposed. That means they look as if they are one against the other. So it may bring you into a dilemma or a confusion. But God is not the author of confusion. It's God who knows the end from the beginning. And he knew what Satan and human beings would do in the last of the last days. So he made it known to his servants, the apostles. But that doesn't mean that is all that God told us about the future. He also told us about the brightness and the golden stage of the church of Jesus Christ in the midst of the dark world and worsening condition. And we said that if all you think about is that that things will be worsening, it will bring you into escapism mentality. That's fatalistic way of thinking. And that will discourage you. And you amount to nothing. Though you are born of God with all the potentials. But you amount to nothing. And you allow the enemy to push your back against the wall. If also you look at scriptures like Ephesians 5, which talks about the glory of the church on earth, not in heaven. That also thinking that things are getting better and better. You may be knocked down. You may be sidetracked by the enemy. You know, the Bible calls him the great deceiver and the tempter. He may tempt you and oppose you if we don't recognize that he exists. And he also is doing evil work on earth. But what we say that if you get to know that this event, both evil and good, are happening concurrently, that means simultaneously happening at the same time. Then you have the right perspective in dealing with situations in life. Personally, as an individual, and also as a church of Jesus Christ, we know our role and function in the midst of this dark world and corrupt nature of this world. So, today we continue and look at the first point that we are in the age of preparation for both the real Christ Jesus, the real Christ Jesus, second coming, as well as the coming of the beast, that's the Antichrist, the beast, as he was revealed in the book of Revelation. We are in the age of preparation for both the real Christ Jesus, second coming, 
as well as the coming of the beast, the Antichrist. The Antichrist, because anti, that means he is against Christ, or he is a false Christ. He is a chameleon. He pretends he is the real Christ. That's what we talk about, the real Jesus Christ and the Antichrist, who is an imposter, who is an emissary, a messenger of Satan, the destroyer, Abaddon, Apollyon, as he is called in both Greek and Hebrew. So number two, we have to know that evil men and women are preparing the way for the Antichrist, that is the beast, according to the book of Revelation. And we saw from First Timothy chapter 4, from verse 1 to 5, as well as Second Timothy chapter 3, from 1 to 9, how people will be boastful and wicked and be truth breakers. That's why you see people agreeing with you or come for things from you and promise they will pay, repay in such a short time. And since then, they haven't paid and they rather are quarreling with you and they are speaking all manner of evil against you. Things are happening. Children are disobedient. People are unthankful from these passages. Then we see that evil men, they worm their way into the homes of gullible women. That's why you may say that many women are gullible. They are found being misled by false prophets and false teachers. Yes. But the Bible tells us the reason why these women are gullible, not that women in general are gullible. But these women are gullible because of depravity. They are sacred sins in their lives. Their conscience is beating them. Yet they are not prepared to repent. That's what the Bible says, ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. They are in church always. And they follow different kinds of prophets and pastors. They, they are not prepared to repent. So these men too are crafty men. They worm their way like snakes, creeping reptiles, knowing the problem with the woman, and they take advantage of them with false doctrines of men and devils. Many times it's just gimmicks that they play on them. So having seen how evil men and evil women are preparing the way of the Antichrist. You could be somebody who says you are not religious. Once you are not religious, you are in the hand of Satan. You are a sure candidate being used as a tool by the devil. And you could be in false religions also. You are still a workpiece, an instrument in the hand of Satan. You could be in the church. And some even are really called by God to preach. But they make themselves tools in the hand of Satan. And they are preparing the way for the devil because the Bible tells us, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, their belly is their God. They mind earthly things. All they think about these natural things of this world. They boast in things they shouldn't boast of. They don't boast in their relation with Christ. They don't boast about what Jesus has done for all humanity. Righteousness is has brought to us, eternal life brought to us. They boast about their jet planes and their plush mansions and their speed cars. These are not what the Bible says we should boast about as Christians and Christian leaders. He said we shouldn't boast, but even if we are to boast, we are to boast that we know the Lord. Not the material things of this world. So they also become tools in the hands of Satan. And as Paul says, not that we are not made able ministers of the gospel. God makes some of us equal, qualified, competent, able ministers of the gospel. But he says, not according to the letter. Not just preaching the Bible. But according to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives us illumination of the Bible. You can take the letter of the Word of God just like you take the letter of any constitution of a nation or the laws of a nation. And you bring evil rather than good. You must know the intent by which the framers of the constitution and laws wrote them. 
that's why in in law natural law and the likes they talk about equity they're talking about the spirit of that law because if you go straightly by the letter of the law it may bring more harm than good in the bible too paul says the same thing that we walk by the spirit of the word for it says the letter kills the letter of the word kills but the spirit gives life all this i'm talking to you about we find in second corinthians chapter 3 and going on to chapter 4 so it says that we are sufficient able ministers of the gospel and then we don't preach ourselves but we preach jesus christ somebody sent it we are messengers Not that we are senders, but somebody sent us. Somebody is the sender. Jesus sent us, and we are messengers. And we are sent by the sender with a message. The message is about Jesus Christ, not about ourselves. Not about us as men of God, as apostles and prophets and cardinals and popes. So we come to, so we many at times, even as preachers, we swim against the move of the Holy Ghost. We frustrate, just like in the Old Testament, the Jews and the Pharisees and Sadducees, who were custodians of the law of God, rather became a hindrance. Today is the same. And at times, too, when you move in the Spirit in your generation, and a, a new generation is coming, and the Holy Spirit is moving in a different way, we of the older generation we become a stopping block. That's why many a time God has to call us home quickly and we block the move of the spirit of god and thinking just like apostle paul before he became apostle paul when he was Saul, he thought he was working for israel god by killing the christians he didn't know he was fighting against the same god he thought he was working for when he was struck on the way to kill the christians in damascus syria and he fell down blind then the voice said, Saul, Saul. Then I said, Who are thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And it is hard to kick against the prick. It's hard to kick against the goat that is used to tame and handle the cattle or the goat or sheep. So we have seen. Then number three, but the very fact that things are getting worse and worse, our concentration is not on the Western situation by evil men and demons. Evil men and demons will be here. This is their time. God has written on his calendar and timetable an end. The other time I read about it, I say if you want to see the end of Satan, the Antichrist and the false prophet, read Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation chapter 20, you see the end of the, the Antichrist and the false prophet and all wicked men and wicked men, chapter 19. When you get to 20, you see the end of Satan himself. So don't put your trust in him. Number three, we get to know that the true Christians, as well as the true church, 2 Timothy 2.19, uh, as well, just like evil men are preparing the way for the Antichrist, as well preparing the way for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells us in Second Timothy 2.19 that nevertheless the foundation of God stands sure and the Lord knows them who are his and let them who name the name of the Lord depart from iniquity, wickedness. You said, Jesus said in a parable, let them all grow. Let them all grow to maturity. Then by their fruit we will know them. Now you are confused. There are people who are claiming to be mouthpiece of God. And they are liars. And they know. And they are putting people in bondage. They are teaching teachings of men and teachings of devils. And you can't find your way out. They call themselves by Christian titles. Apostles and prophets and lights and bishops. And you are confused. But whatever they teach, as the Bible says in First Timothy and Second Timothy, 
They put people in bondage. They tell you even not to eat certain kind of food for certain reasons. And they make you fast and they make you mutilate your body as false humility to angels and things they are puffer. Paul writes further in Corinthians about such people. And they, they use pious words, slick tongues. They change the tone by which they speak. They don't speak normally. They speak by what we call in Bible college and ceremony, pastoral tunes. And you know, and God says, hey, that's not normal. That is gimmick. Do you understand it? <laughs> Anointing doesn't come by these gimmicks. Anointing comes by your relationship with Christ and the Holy Spirit. So we concentrate on the Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. What does it say? He says that Christ is coming for his church which he loves, which he gave up himself for. I'm paraphrasing. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church. They have come back to verbatim as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Some say the church has failed. The church is filthy. Now that before the church came, Christianity came, our elders, our fathers of old were living upright and moral life. Christianity has brought the problem. No, Christianity has brought the problem. We were sinners, wicked people. We were worshipping idols. We were killing and eating human flesh. Do you understand it? And we use demons to curse people. Then we said it because of the fear of death that they curse people, that some people try to behave. But that is bondage. Like I said, if the population of a country is 100, 100, 100, then the church comes there and able to convert five people and then it's reduced to 95 and you go there you don't know the history of that country or the history of that town or city and you see 95 people misbehaving and sinning then we say the church is there and people are sinning or the church didn't bring it they were 100 percent sinners the church had rather done well by taking five out of it and it's 95 until jesus came all of us were going to hell do you understand it the church has not contributed. But the Bible says the foundation of God stands sure. There are people who are parading as apostles of Christ. And the Bible says the apostles of Satan. Because Satan himself is a chameleon. He parades himself as an angel of light, knowing very well he's an angel of darkness. He camouflages himself. And people are doing that. But the Bible says Jesus will come for a holy church without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle. So that means, as he promised in Matthew 16, and getting to 18, he says, upon this confession I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is the one building the church, and the church is the one spreading the gospel of the kingdom of God. It's not the church building the church. It's Jesus building the church. And he said, no devil, no human being, no political ideology, whether communism or whether socialism or anything or capitalism will be able, whether military dictatorship will be able to overcome it. Spiritual powers cannot. Powers and principalities cannot overcome it. And he releases his church. The body, his representatives, his ambassadors, to spread the kingdom of God, the rule of God. And he said, as he gave to King Nebuchadnezzar, that the last kingdom, which is the kingdom of God and his Christ, will not be given to any other. Do you understand? You either fall on him and you get broken, or he falls on you and you are smashed. There's no other way. You can't fight it. But then, we'll look at the very fact that our concentration shall be, as the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, that looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, shame, facing the contradiction of sinners. Listen, as a church, as Christian, you'll be facing the contradiction, the opposition of sinners, wicked men, wicked women. It's a, a, a narrow gate and a straight way. Do you understand it? There will be challenges. And the Bible says, he who will live godly in Christ shall face persecution. That doesn't mean you have been overcome. But you look unto Jesus. Don't look at the problem. Don't look at the evil men doing the wicked thing. Last section, part one, I said you look at the corner of our eyes. Like that of Nehemiah putting up, rebuilding the broken walls of Jerusalem. The Sambias and the Tobias and the Geshems, as well as the Nodias who were in fifth column inside and the external enemies were trying to break his focus that he should leave the building of the wall and come because they felt that he wanted to make himself king. So they are going to report to the king of Medipatia to tell him that he wants to rebel. He said, you are lying. It's fabrication, figment of your mind. Concentrate on what God has given to you. Build. We are called to build, not to war. But the cause of the building, we war, we fight. But the fighting is not our prime goal. Do you understand it? And we are going to get better and better. So, we'll read a parable of Jesus in Luke 19 to end this section. We are not finishing today. We are finishing at the next session. But it drew as well to read Luke chapter 19 from verse 13. It's, it starts from verse 11, but the main verse is 13. So let's take it and see. We call it the parable of the pound or the parable of the ten minas. It's, it's almost like the parable of the talents. But this one, they were all given same amount to work with. The parable of the talent, somebody was giving one, somebody was giving two, somebody was giving five. But these are not, these are ten servants he called and gave them equal amount. So we read Luke 19 from Levi. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. That's what we think. We are to work the kingdom of God out. Say, I have the responsibility to work out the kingdom of God from shore to shore, from place to place. He said, a man of noble worth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. Jesus has gone. He will come back. But he's gone to a far country. So he called out ten of his servants and gave them ten pounds or ten minas. Put this money. I like the King James verse. I said, occupy till I come. That's why we have the word occupation. It's talking about work. The Christian is to work. The church is to work. It's not a free zone. We are to work. That's the dispensation we are in. Dispensation of harvesting, discipling the nation. Do you understand it? We are not to fold our arms. Until we finish the work Jesus has given us, that time, it's not coming. But he will surely come. If we miss it in our generation, he will raise up another generation to finish the work. Then he will come. Now, but his subject hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. That is what the kings of this world and the people of this world are doing. If you check some two, you will see they are incensed. They don't want to walk by Christian values, the Judeo Christian values. They don't want to walk by the Bible. When it comes to marriage, they want to go their own way. When it comes to business, they want to go their own way. When it comes to education of children, they want to go their own way, not according to God's word. They hated him and sent a delegation after him. We don't want this man to be our king. That's what many people are saying. They don't want Jesus to be their king. He was made king, but God the Father will make him king and send him back. However, and return home. Jesus will surely return home. Then he sent for the servant to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Multiplied by ten. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Christian and Christian church. Be trustworthy in small matters. God will reward you. Take charge of ten cities. 
You remember when we were talking about the millennium, God would divide to the resulted Christians the world for us to rule. The second came and said, Sir, your minion has earned five more. What you do for Christ in this world, you get eternal rewards. His master said, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Just like the parable of talent, say, Here's your mina. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you were a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow, like the one in the parable of the talent. Some of you are like that. You are ungrateful. You don't recognize the talents and the gift God has given you. You look at the Jones and you think they are better than you. Because of that, you, you don't do anything in the church. You don't do anything for God. And you keep murmuring and complaining. See the result such people get. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words. Your own words will judge you, not Jesus' words. You wicked servant. If you behave like that, God considers you a wicked person. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in, reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I would have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Said, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has more will be given, but as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Say serious. Serious. That is how it is now. So do you see, we are respectively evil men and Christians are preparing the way for both Jesus Christ's second coming and the manifestation of the Antichrist. It gives us confidence. It gives us hope. It gives us faith. Don't be discouraged, Christian. Don't be discouraged, Church of God. It's going to get better for us. As the world gets darker and darker, our light rather will shine. Light shines better in darkness. Do you understand it? And when things are rotting, then you can see the saltiness of a salt. We season it. So there's hope for us. Despite things are getting worse in this world, things too are getting better simultaneously. The church is going forward, moving forward. As wicked men are getting worse, good Christians are getting better and better and better until Christ will come for us, will reach the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ. I want to end here for the time being and continue at the next section. But I want you to have the confidence that you as a Christian, don't be discouraged by the evil things around you. They are not in charge. Satan is not running the show. The Holy Spirit and Jesus are running the show. Do you understand it? And make sure you are preparing the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Looking upon him, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. And I want you to give your life to Jesus. Many of you say you won't go to church because you've seen some Christians or some pastors misbehaving. That's why they are hypocrites. You are more hypocrites than them. You are hypocrites, but Jesus is not those preachers who came to die on the cross. Jesus died for you, and you are hypocrite to say somebody's hypocrisy is keeping you away from the church. Now, if you see a church that there's no hypocrisy in it, don't join, because you will defile it, because you are a hypocrite, because there's no human being who hasn't got blemish or spot or wrinkle. So don't join it. You make it imperfect. You are not perfect. You keep putting perfection on all people and charging them with perfection. What about you? You couldn't even be faithful to your wife or your husband. Then you talk about perfection. Join it. And God's mercy and grace will wash you. Say, dear Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I've been using other people as an excuse for me not giving my life to you. I repent of it. I know you died for me. 
and you were raised for my righteousness. You are the Son of God. Come into my heart and be my Lord and my personal Savior. I thank you for getting me born again and making me a child of God. I thank you, Father. You are now my Father, and I'm, I'm now your child. Help me to walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I pray with you, but before then, let me tell you the four spiritual exercises you must do daily feeding on the Word of God. Do your quiet time on your own and find a good daily guide which will also help you. But read the Bible before you read the daily guide, the passages they give to you. Do you understand? So that your relation with God will not be through a third person. Then number two, pray unto God. That's your talking to God. Pray to the Father through the name of Jesus. He will answer you. There's no name that's above that name, Jesus. Then number three, join a good church. A good Bible-believing church. Not a satanic church. Not a false church. Preparing the way for the Antichrist. There are many in the church. The Bible calls them Babylon. 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 The false prophet is not doing it outside the church. He will do it inside the church and bring other religions on board. So take note of that. To so let God help you. Hebrews 10, 23, 25. Then number four. Tell others what Jesus has done for you. You don't know much of the Bible, but use your life as a testimony. And then they will come to the Lord. As you grow, you know more of the word and preach through the word. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for my brother and sister. I pray that you fill them with the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name and lead them by the Spirit. Break every yoke of bondage, every hold of the devil over their life. I break it with the blood of Jesus. I can see somebody having severe stomach troubles right now in the name of Jesus. Put your hand there and be healed. God is healing you. God is healing somebody from one year, the right year. In the name of Jesus, receive your healing right now in the name of Jesus. I can see some people rising up from their bed. They are steadfast in their bed. I can see you walking. Rise up from your bed and start walking. Walk in the name of Jesus. I command you to walk in the name of Jesus. Lift up that hand. That hand that is with it. Lift it up. You have had a stroke. But God says he's healing. Lift up that hand and clap it together in the name of Jesus. Say, I am healed. And everybody who is sick, do what you couldn't do before. In the name of Jesus, I break the spirit of infirmity over your life and set you loose and free and command the healing virtue of Jesus to make you every week old. In Jesus' name, we call it down. Amen. Now, we'll conclude next section. God's willing, if you'll be able, but we'll try to conclude on the preparation for the coming of Christ and the coming of the Antichrist. Now you've seen the perspective in which you have to look at things and we will know better when we meet the next session. Until then, until then, until then. Shalom. May the peace of God and the joy of the Lord be your portion. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you and us all. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.